distinguished former judges of the Supreme Court of India, my very dear sister, Justice Bibi Nagaratna, members of the family of Justice Venkatramaya, Chief Justice Prasanna Varale and judges of the Karnataka High Court, both emeritus and sitting, Dr. Sudhir Krishwami, Vice Chancellor, National Law School of India University, Dr. Nes Nigam, Registrar of NLSIU, members of the faculty, senior advocates, distinguished guests and dear students. It is a matter of great pride and honor to deliver the centennial memorial lecture commemorating the life and legacy of former Chief Justice of India, Justice E.S. Venkatamaya, ESV. I'm overawed, overwhelmed by the weight of the occasion, the presence of this galaxy of intellectuals, and above all, the erudite judge in whose memory the series is instituted. But I take this occasion also to pay my own personal tribute to the abiding friendship of Nagaratna's parents with my own. They maintained that friendship both on the bench and in the years that followed after they had ceased to be judges of the Supreme Court. Justice E.S. Venkatramaya was the 19th Chief Justice of India. He started his journey as a lawyer in Bangalore. He went on to be elevated to the bench of the Karnataka High Court and eventually found his way to the Supreme Court in whose service he spent over a decade. Though his legal journey is nothing short of inspirational, he would often quip that he went from SCC, that is the small cause court, to SC, that is the Supreme Court. But anyone who knew him and his work would attest that he was a teacher and an academic before being a lawyer or a judge. His practice of the law was always accompanied by his academic endeavors. In the Supreme Court of the 1980s, among the distinguished judges who comprised the bench, there was then, as there is now as well, a great sense of camaraderie among the judges. Judges are popularly nicknamed by colleagues on the bench, there were two who had this nickname in those days. I will disclose the identity of one, but not of the other. One of those judges was nicknamed Lord Wilberforce. The other was nicknamed Swamiji by my father. And as you've all probably guessed, Swamiji was nicknamed as Swamiji because of his great erudition in Sanskrit and spirituality, and that was Justice Venkatramaya. I'll leave you guessing about who Lord Wilberforce was. <laughs> when I think of his academic career, I'm reminded of bookends, which is how his teaching punctuated ESV's legal practice. He started teaching law in 1945, at the same time as he enrolled at the bar and was actively engaged in teaching law at various law colleges throughout his career. After Hanging his robes as a judge, he was appointed the M.K. Nambiar Chair for Constitutional Law here at NLSIU. Teaching the law in many ways was his first and last love. Naturally then, the many landmark judgments that he authored are impressed upon by his profound body of academic work, touching upon a wide range of issues such as human rights, freedom of the press, federalism, and citizenship. In his judicial writings, we see an empath, an environmentalist, and a champion of free speech. He was a fierce defender of judicial independence in S.P. Gupta versus Union of India in 1981. We saw in him a champion of freedom of the press in Indian Express newspapers versus Union of India in 1985, where he balanced the freedom of press with the taxing powers of the state, writing that as long as the court sits, Newspaper men need not have the fear of their freedom being curtailed by unconstitutional means. 
in MC Mehta versus Union of India in 1988, he separated the financial capacity of the tanneries discharging effluents into the Ganga from their obligations towards the environment. He held it was not merely a directive principle of state policy under Article 48A of the Constitution to protect and improve the environment but a fundamental duty of the central government to quote, as I say, direct all educational institutions to teach at least one hour a week lessons relating to the protection and improvement of the natural environment, including the forests, the lakes, the rivers and wildlife in the first 10 classes. As many of you would know, he was writing this judgment when the environment law in the country was still in its early stages. He was thinking way ahead of his times for the environment and also for the future generation of the country. Justice Benjamin Cardozo, a former US Supreme Court judge and scholar wrote that it is a judge's inevitable duty to decide based on their experience, study and reflection. In Justice Venkatamaya, we find an exemplar judge who just did that. A perfect blend of pedagogical and judicial acumen Justice Venkatramaya's two worlds often collided. As his juniors in the profession and also as citizens of this country, we have had the distinct benefit of insight into his wonderful mind and his musings through his judgments and his published works. Therefore, before I begin, I must thank my very fond sister, Nagu, for having given me this great honor to be here. The academic in ESV would approve of a lecture in his memory. I thank Justice Nagaratna for organizing this lecture and having me. I have chosen for myself the theme of constitutional imperative of the state navigating discrimination in public and private spaces. In choosing this subject, I draw inspiration from the words of Justice ESV's colleague and brother, in S.P. Gupta versus Union of India, Justice P.N. Bhagwati, underpinning the importance of an independent judiciary, he cast a wide role for the courts of a society that is, as he said, pulsating with urges of gender justice, worker justice, minorities justice, Dalit justice, and equal justice between chronic unequals. It makes one think whether, as such a pulsating society, we have succeeded in creating public and private spaces that are conducive to people across dividing lines. Whether the laws and policies we adopt further the objects of the Constitution in both these spaces alike. In creating our public offices, our lawmakers and constitution makers assumed that these offices would come to be occupied by righteous persons who would exercise their discretion wisely that's why Dr. B.R. Ambedkar said on the last of those speeches before the adoption of the Constitution that the Constitution will be as good as the people who operate her. The law presumes, for instance, that civil and criminal courts, which are vested with wide-ranging inherent powers, will exercise those powers to do complete justice. But what is justice? Is my version and understanding of justice the same as one of yours? Is there only one form of justice? If it is a rigid singular concept, then why do we have overturning judgments? We just overturned one just a few days ago in a combination of seven, less than six months after the earlier one was delivered. A person's sense of justice emerges from their conscience. A lot of factors contribute towards molding a person's sense of justice, such as the interactions of people through reading, or in many cases, just by observing. For example, my sense of justice on issues of gender evolved with my interactions with my own spouse, Kalpana, with my interactions with Justice Sujata Manohar and Justice Ranjana Desai, with whom I was sharing the bench at the Bombay High Court with Justice Ranjana Desai. Our sense of justice evolves when we are ready and willing to open our minds beyond the assumptions that the society has taught us to hold. It is only when we have an open mind are we likely to feel the need to deviate from some of these base assumptions 
to curate our own sense of justice. We often see this need to deviate take the form of legal amendments and overruling of previous decisions that were perfectly valid until a point of time. The law in that sense responds to social change as the fundamental assumptions underlying it alter over time. One such assumption is the difference between public spaces and private spaces. As a society, we ascribe certain roles to certain persons. These ascribed roles may not always be based on objective abilities or their lack, but rather on certain subjective norms. Artificial markers of ability, aside from one's skills, such as gender, class, caste, and disability, often come to define the roles we give to ourselves. For instance, purely on grounds of gender, women are often perceived as natural caregivers who must tend to the domestic needs of the family, while the men must undertake remunerative activities and form the financial axis of the household. It's so untrue. In my own personal life, I was the sole caregiver of a spouse who was battling cancer for almost a decade. Much as we have designated roles to genders, since these roles are location sensitive, we, also, we have also demarcated neatly the public space and the private space where each of these must be performed. Our laws, as we shall see in due course, have crystallized this narrative of what is public and what is private. Our laws and policies choose to treat people based on the physical location of their actions. To substantiate this point, the Indian Penal Code provides that when two or more persons, by way of a brawl in a public place, disturb the public's peace, they are said to commit an offense of affray. We must note that a brawl between two people will be punishable only if its location is a public place and not otherwise. The thrust of the law, therefore, is not only the inherent merit or demerit of brawls, but on whether and where they take place. While there may be some merit to this distinction in certain situations, a holistic, constitutionally governed society must be willing to look beyond this binary of public and private. This dichotomy between what is private and what is public has formed the basis of the feminist and economic critiques of our laws and policies for several years. For freedom of expression to truly exist, it must exist in both these spaces. It cannot exist in one and not in the other. Both these spaces do not exist in neat individual spheres like that of a Venn diagram. They often overlap. The same hierarchy that pervades the private way seeps into the public and vice versa, making both spaces slightly less equitable. There is therefore a need to look beyond this binary of what is public and what is private and search for the grievances that underlie both these spheres. For instance, the household, which is understood as a private space, is a site of economic activity by a homemaker who is not remunerated for it. Similarly, in public spaces, women are consigned to distinctively feminine, service-oriented, and often sexually and often sexualized occupations. Thus, both sides involve rights and their infringement. However, if the law chooses that it will interfere only in the latter, namely the public spaces, perhaps because of its visibility, the law would be unjust. The framers of our constitution did not envisage such a geographical application of the law. There is increased percolation between those two locations whose oppressive biases and prejudices have transcended the boundary between the public and the private. Therefore, fixating on the public-private rather than identifying both of their common problems furthers stereotypes about gender, ableism, and many such identities. These stereotypes create a self-perpetuating loop of who belongs where and entrench 
the unjust outcomes of both the public and the private. Having said that, I believe that this public-private paradigm and its underlying assumptions could serve as a framework for examining our institutions to some extent. This is, in a way, a furtherance of the critique of this divide. As the division between the two spaces evaporates, we must examine our preparedness to secure the rights of our people in this new realm, which is neither wholly public nor wholly private. With technology virtually ending the spatial constraints, we must examine how our laws and institutions can overcome the limitations of both public and private spaces. Our laws and procedures must expand beyond this binary and identify the oppression and the oppressed wherever they may be. Even beyond that, we must ask ourselves what happens when the conventional public and private spaces are inhabited by those not stereotypically associated with them in situations that are uncharacteristic of that geography. When a private home is a site of employment for a house help, does the law protect their economic and personal rights as much as it does the rights of a corporate office employee? The purpose of the law would have to be extended to safeguard the interests of the conventional and the unconventional participants of both these situations. Let me in the first part of my presentation this morning deal with gender discrimination from the perspective of this public and private divide. Between an individual and a state, lies a whole litany of institutions that mediate and define the individual's existence with respect to the state and in of themselves, institutions of the family, marriage, religious institutions, educational institutions, healthcare organizations, and non-governmental organizations form a part of the relationship that we have with our governments, with our courts, and with each other. These institutions also influence our access to resources and opportunities alongside social markers of identity such as gender. For instance, a 2018 report on women in prisons by the Ministry of Women and Child Development found that abandon abandonment of women inmates by the members of their families is a frequent phenomenon. These women are left on their own to lead a solitary legal battle. The reasons could be social stigma and financial constraints to pursue legal remedies or the general dispensability of the individual to the continuance of the family itself. The inherent merits of our laws and our legal aid aside, the institution of family is, crit is critical to the inmate's ability to access the law for herself. Without such support, she may eventually be able to find her way to the courts on the strength of legal aid, and the void created by one institution of the family may eventually be filled in the form of legal assistance. But the woman stands on shakier and uncertain grounds until that happens. Such is the influence of these institutions that they not only mediate a person's ability to access the law, but also sometimes prevail over the legal rights of the individuals themselves. Our courts have in the past, in fact, privileged these institutions over the individual. Our courts have held that the need to preserve the institutions is greater than the need to protect the individual's rights. For instance, it was long held in the context of marriage and marriage laws and the scope of court's intervention that introducing the tenets of constitutional law in the privacy of the home or a marriage would weaken the institution of marriage itself. The sensitive sphere was considered to be an intimate sanctuary, immune from the applications of the cold principles of constitutional law. In all fairness, this tendency to insulate private lives of individuals is well-founded, even if we may disagree with effects such as the ones I just mentioned. After all, privacy is but an extension of personhood and dignity. Beyond privacy, as a right, is a guarantee against the excessive intrusion of the individual's life by both state and non-state actors against excesses of the public and private authorities. It affords an effective barrier against surveillance, against restrictions on expression. 
What is then the harm, I ask myself, what is then the harm in stopping law at the threshold of the household? The answer lies in the fact that the household, as much as it provides a private sanctuary to its inhabitants, is not simply by that reason an equitable space. Despite the general sense of security households offer, there is a fair chance that these spaces may become unequal and unfair to some. It is not uncommon to hear that when faced with a financial choice between the education of a male child and a female child, the family will choose in favor of the former, the male child. There are subtler versions of this inequality. The pressures a woman faces when stepping out of the household for her education, profession, or recreation do not exist for her male counterparts. If the hierarchies persist in the private space and the law looks the other way in the name of the sanctity of the household or the sanctity of marriage, we would be failing in the promise of equal protection of law and qualifying it with a caveat based on the location of the wrongdoing. This would be a diluted understanding of what privacy entails. It is not a cloak for infringement of the rights away from the watchful eyes of the law. It is a guarantee against excesses and not against the very reach of the law and due process. Perhaps my own sagacious mother had a joke on this, which I will just share with you. There was a Marathi play at that time, which was titled, I retire hote, the mother retires. And she would constantly remind us of what would happen to us if this mother in the family retired, if I retired. Hierarchies, prejudices, and stigmas travel beyond the public-private binaries. But fortunately for us, just like the problem, the solution is equally fluid. And it is in the fluidity of legal solutions and social solutions that judges exercise their craft. The gains of improving our private lives will reflect in our public life as well. As we began to recognize that these private structures are not constitutional vacuums, and injustices in private spaces are also indeed what they are, unjust, we were able to better assess their role in society. This did not happen overnight. The dissolution of the barrier between the public and private lives of women is what led to this change. Very recently, in, DP, in Deepika Singh versus Central Administrative Tribunal, the denial of maternity leave based on a woman's previous marriage circumstances was challenged. This woman was denied maternity leave on the ground that her husband from a prior marriage, which had ended in the death of the first wife, had two biological children. And she was, though the biological mother for the first time, as between her and the husband, she had three children. And therefore, she was denied maternity leave. Interpreting Section 3C of the Maternity Benefit Act of 1961 and correlating the definition of delivery with it, a bench of the Supreme Court of which I was a part held that the act aimed at securing women's right to pregnancy, maternity leave, and affording reasonable flexibility to live both as a mother and as a worker. It then took up the challenge to Rule 43 of the Central Civil, Civil, Civil Services Leave Rules of 1972. The judgment clarified that the distinction between child care and maternity leave, ensuring civil servants have access to both, by rejecting stereotypical ideas of what a family is, the court embraced inclusivity for diverse family structures. This decision reflected the evolving societal norms and the need to reimagine family concepts beyond conventional nuclear models. In Kriti versus Oriental Insurance, the Supreme Court held that in deciding the compensation for the loss of life in a motor vehicle accident, we have to account for the value of a homemaker's labor within the household. The fact that such labor is not economically measured by our society could not be perpetuated and furthered by the court's refusal to interfere. The basis of the public-private divide and the perception that courts and laws apply differently to both spaces is inaccurate. The aged notion that what men do is public, what women do is private, has no application in societies governed by constitutions. 
we have come to realize that these spaces cannot be appropriated by a particular class of people at the cost of the rest. The public places and public spaces are for everyone who wants to access them and cannot be made prohibitively difficult to reach for some. Public spaces are more than mere containers of social action. Public space is defined not by its use for the public alone. They are spaces that structure the very nature of our discourse. It is, of course, unfortunate if our public spaces in their actual form do not represent the diversity of our country. But what is more concerning for us as sentient beings is the loss of discourse in our society today. How do we incorporate changes that make our institutions more inclusive without hearing the voices of the people whose representation we are talking about? Without such a discourse, our policies would only have the benefit of the observed experiences of a select few rather than the benefit of the lived experiences of our people. We cannot, despite our best intentions, walk in their shoes. We can merely pave the way for their effective participation in decision making. We need spaces of representation for representation to truly happen. This principle applies to public spaces just as much as it does to the private sphere. Public spaces and public lives, as Hannah Arendt puts it, represent certain values. It is in these realms that men can be truly free, she said. Public spaces to Arendt represent spaces that were premised on a certain equality of peers, where individuals purposely came together in their efforts towards improving the lives of people and consolidated the efforts against tyranny. The public space was thus the avenue of realization of personal and social goals. A democratic society, its laws, and its institutions are supposed to enable exactly this kind of congregation of minds for better social outcomes. Our constitution is a testament to what deliberations can offer. For that, in turn, our institutions must facilitate this plurality. The challenges faced by women and other disadvantaged groups transcend mere ideas of visibility, weaving a complex tapestry within the public sphere. The glass ceiling, an elusive yet formidable barrier, encapsulates these challenges, impeding the progression of capable women in both professional and personal spheres. It obstructs the upward mobility of talented women, demanding a nuanced understanding to navigate a path towards dismantling these barriers. India's first female physician, Rukmabai, was a woman who bravely challenged societal norms and patriarchal constraints in the, in the late 19th century, such as the practice of child marriages. She became a symbol of resistance against regressive practices, setting a precedent for women to defy societal expectations and pursue their aspirations. The fact that she was herself married at the age of 19 did not stop her from championing the cause of other women who faced a similar destiny. Her efforts eventually led to the enactment of the Age of Consent Act of 1891. This is not the study, this is not the story of Indian women alone. The movie Hidden Figures provides a resonating example. I just watched the movie on a flight recently back to India from the US. And this movie provides an example how this is reflected on a global scale and affects all individuals. This cinematic piece provides a compelling portrayal of Catherine Johnson, an African-American mathematician, and her colleagues who played pivotal roles in NASA's space missions. In a poignant scene, Catherine confronts racial and gender biases as she asserts her expertise to calculate trajectories of space flight. This moment lays bare the systemic hurdles women of color face in professional arenas, showcasing the resilience required to break through the glass ceiling. The echoes of Catherine's struggles resonate with the pervasive nature of gender discrimination faced by women in various spheres of our life. The challenges depicted are not confined to the realms of fiction or movies, 
They mirror the battles faced by women in the public sphere. Delving into legal precedents further emphasizes the persistent nature of gender discrimination, unraveling a narrative that extends beyond the boundaries of the film set. For instance, in Anuj Garg versus Union of India, the constitutional validity of the provision of the Punjab Excise Act restricting the employment of women in establishments serving intoxicating substances was challenged. The court observed that the provision being a pre-constitutional law needed review given changed societal conditions. It struck down the provision asserting that it perpetuated sexual differences and restricted a citizen's right to be considered for employment. Likewise, the decision in Charu Khurana versus Union of India, which struck down the discriminatory bylaws of the Cine Costume Makeup Artists and Hairdressers Association of Mumbai. These legal vignettes not only spotlight the intricacies of gender discrimination, but also underscore the adaptability of legal frameworks in addressing contemporary challenges. Courtroom battles in cases like Deepika Singh reveal the dynamic nature of the law and its capability of responding to evolving societal norms. These legal victories serve as beacons, illuminating the path towards a just and more equitable society. The transformative impact of legal intervention against gender-based discrimination is evident, heralding a new era of consciousness and accountability in our society. However, as we celebrate these victories, the quest for true equity still persists. Despite legal victories and societal movements, subtle forms of bias and discrimination persist. For instance, workplace discrimination, microaggressions, and unequal opportunities continue to undermine the principle of equality. Another persistent challenge lurks behind the gender pay gap. This issue is particularly pronounced for Indian women, especially those belonging to marginalized communities. Despite their significant contributions to various professional spheres, women continue to face disparities in remuneration compared to their male counterparts. Nobel laureate Claudia Goldwyn in her research has actively reflected that women are vastly underrepresented in the global labor market and when they work, they earn less than men. The disconcerting reality of the gender pay gap in India illuminates a complex interplay of factors, including societal norms, cultural expectations, and systemic unconscious biases. The pay gap widens as it intersects, it, as it intersects with other forms of discrimination, amplifying challenges for women who navigate both gender and racial biases. This is a stark reminder that achieving true equity requires more than legal provisions. It demands ongoing advocacy and systemic changes to dismantle entrenched biases and ensure equal opportunities for all. Efforts to bridge the gender pay gap must address intersectional discrimination faced by Indian women. Advocacy should encompass not only gender sensitive policies, but also initiatives that recognize and rectify the unique challenges faced by women from diverse backgrounds. In the second part of my presentation this morning, let me dwell on disability rights. I would like to speak about the public private divide in the realm of disability rights. Disability often becomes a barrier, denying individuals access to public opportunities due to societal biases perceiving disability as a limitation. Even when given a chance, essential accommodations might be missing, like offering a job to a person with a disability, but lacking necessary workplace tools or infrastructure, hindering their success firsthand. Moreover, individuals with disabilities often encounter doubts about their capabilities after receiving opportunities as a result of ingrained ableism. I remember my former law clerk a Rhodes Scholar who is visually impaired telling me that they face skepticism, especially in a job interview for tech-driven roles. This limits their growth due to biased assumptions about their disabilities. The judiciary in the state of Karnataka is among the highest number of employers of persons with disabilities, particularly in their staff. As part of the e-committee, training to equip 
these members who are differently abled with ICT tools has opened up a whole new universe for them. This can also be exemplified through the Oscar winning film Rain Man in 1988. In the film, the main protagonist, Raymond, who has autism and Sauvon syndrome, faces skepticism rooted in ableism regarding his task abilities. This is akin to real life scenarios where skills of individuals with disabilities are doubted despite meeting requirements perpetuating, perpetuating exclusionary biases. The ratification of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities in 2007 signaled a paradigm shift aligning India with the social model of disability and human rights. This global commitment to inclusivity has had a profound impact on subsequent legal interpretations and intervention. The legislative journey is a narrative of progress from a charity-centric mindset to the acknowledgement of rights as inherent in every person. Post the ratification of the convention, Indian courts creatively embrace principles emphasizing non-discrimination, reasonable accommodation, and affirmative action while deciding issues which concern disability rights. In Jija Ghosh versus the Union of India in 2016, the Supreme Court strongly condemned discrimination against Jija Ghosh, who was deboarded by an airline due to her disability, awarding damages and highlighting the impact of social barriers on disabled lives. In Vikash Kumar versus Union Public Service Commission in 2021, our court observed that individuals with writer's cramp or dysgraphia, not recognized as a benchmark disability in the Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act, are entitled to a scribe in a civil services examination. This decision underscores the principle of reasonable accommodation under the RPWD Act, emphasizing the positive obligation of state and private ent entities to provide support for full participation. It marks a significant shift from a medical to a human rights model of disability align aligning with the convention. This has been showcased in recent judgments, such as Ravindra Kumar Dhariwal versus Union of India, which is of 2022. In this case, the Supreme Court revitalized Article 14 by invoking inclusive equality and reasonable accommodation. It addressed whether a disciplining, whether disciplining a central reserve police force assistant commandant who developed a mental disability during employment was discriminatory. The court emphasized the importance of dignity and equality under Section 3 of the RPWD Act, highlighting the state's positive obligation to fulfill the rights of persons with disability. Section 20 expands the obligation to provide reasonable accommodation, leading the court to conclude that the scope of this obligation has significantly broadened. Cases like Akanksha Singh versus the High Court of Delhi also highlight a commitment to accessibility, expanding the scope of disability under the Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act in 2016. Courts in cases such as these rejected categorizing bipolar disorder as a sign of incapacity, emphasizing the capabilities of individuals with mental health conditions. Courts have also recognized and enforced the principle of accessibility, directing the University Grants Commission to establish accessibility guidelines for higher educational institutions. The judiciary, while recognizing intersectionality of gender and disability, has recognized the vulnerability of disabled women, emphasizing the potential for indirect discrimination they may face. Recent cases serve as illustrations of the judiciary's evolving role, not only in recognizing individual rights, but in addressing intricate intersections of disability with gender and mental health, further enriching the discourse on equality. This underscores that disability is nuanced. It's an individualized concept shaped by factors like mental impairment and personal circumstances, rejecting a one-size-fits-all approach. The legal framework emphasizes the need to avoid stigmatization and discrimination against individuals with mental health issues or disability, recognizing the impact on their sense of disability. This imperative aligns with the concept of universal design, 
which embodies the essence of inclusivity by advocating for spaces that embrace and accommodate everyone irrespective of ability. An architectural access audit has recently conduct, been conducted by the Supreme Court's Committee on Accessibility of the Premises under the able guidance of my very distinguished colleague, Justice Ravindra Bhatt, who is fortunately present in the audience. Such audits play a crucial role in evaluating the accessibility of buildings and public spaces. These audits identify barriers and recommend modifications, ensuring that spaces go beyond legal compliance to demonstrate a commitment to human rights, social responsibility, and fostering inclusivity and diversity. The Supreme Court Committee on Accessibility's meticulous approach in its report, auditing the Supreme Court's facilities, provides invaluable insights into the existing challenges. From physical accessibility issues, like the absence of wheelchair-friendly amenities, to functional challenges, such as the lack of sign language interpreters, the report paints a comprehensive picture of the challenges to accessibility and inclusion. The identification of gaps in physical and functional accessibility is not merely an exercise in critique but a strategic move towards an inclusive reform. The report's recommendations ranging from introducing accessible route maps, accessible route maps, to overalling restrooms for better accessibility showcases a commitment to tangible solutions. We are currently on the path to adopting the su suggestions outlined in the report by Justice Butt, which seeks to comprehensively address concerns about accessibility and inclusivity within the legal system. This involves physical improvements, such as accessible routes, designated parking, along with the establishment of dedicated sections, mediation protocols, and enhanced facilities like accessible restrooms and lactation rooms. Cases involving individuals with HIV are prioritized, and de-identification measures during legal proceedings have been implemented. Additionally, we use technology with tailored tailored online resources for persons with disabilities, highlighting the importance of inclusive digital spaces. Therefore, universal design, as both a concept and a practical approach, becomes a tool to break the cycle highlighted in Anuj Garg. It is not just about addressing existing barriers, but ensuring that, is, that the design of our spaces inherently considers the diverse needs of all our individuals. The recognition of the role of technology aligns with the principles of universal design, extending the reach of inclusiveness beyond physical spaces to the virtual realm. The role of technology in shaping inclusive spaces extends beyond just convenience. It becomes a democratizing force, ensuring that access to information and legal processes is no longer a privilege, but a right. The Supreme Court's E-Committee has in its initiatives underscored just this, emphasizing the need to make filings accessible to lawyers with visual impairment, ensuring proper placement of stamps and watermarks to promote accessibility through assistive technology and making captures on the Supreme Court and High Court websites accessible. Recently, the Supreme Court has begun providing sign language interpretation for lawyers with, he with hearing impairments. This was demonstrated in a recent case where a hearing impaired advocate, Ms. Sara Suni, was allowed to argue virtually with the assistance of a sign language interpreter in our court. As we navigate through these legal landscapes and policy considerations, the concept of crypt theory emerges as a revolutionary force. Crypt theory, born within the realm of disability studies, stands as a powerful tool to explore the experiences of individuals with disability, acknowledging the historical exclusion and social barriers which they face. Developed at the intersection of gender and sexuality, crypt theory forms an integral part of critical disability studies. Crypt time, a profound aspect of this theory, challenges societal assumptions about time, energy, and resources shedding light on pervasive able-bodied perspectives. By highlighting the unique needs of individuals with disabilities, crypt theory 
prompts a revaluation of our understanding of tasks, accommodations, and expectations in both life and work. Originating from Alison Kafer's work in feminist queer grip, this theory delves into queer temporal theory, encouraging exploration of intricate connections between time, marginalization, and visibility. It challenges the conventional understanding of time and urges consideration of how individuals with disabilities navigate temporal aspects of their lives, acknowledging their diverse temporal experiences. For instance, this theory goes beyond the notion of just accommodation. It calls for an active valuation and integration of unique perspectives. For example, a school implementing crip theory might emphasize not only providing ramps for wheelchair access, but also fostering an inclusive curriculum that represents diverse perspectives, experiences, and contributions of individuals with disability. So this goes beyond meeting basic accessibility standards. It actively values and integrates the unique viewpoints of students with disabilities, creating a more enriching educational environment for everyone who is involved. In the last part of my presentation this morning, let me deal with private discrimination, which is perhaps a little more controversial. I will explore the complex terrain of equality and justice where we find ourselves confronting a formidable obstacle, the domain of private discrimination. This dimension, often concealed within the folds of societal interactions and private arrangements, demands our attention as we unravel the layers of inequality embedded within our society. I would like to begin by dissecting the jurisprudential origins of anti-discrimination law in India. A crucial dichotomy surfaces formal equality and substantive equality. Article 14 and Article 15 of our constitution birth these perspectives. Legal equality grounded in the equal application of the law encounters its counterpart, substantive equality, which delves into nuanced characteristics of groups, acknowledging the potential for indirect discrimination. While legal equality ensures uniformity in application, Substantive equality recognizes the need to accommodate differences within the application of the law. Articles 15, 2 and 17 of the Constitution directly address discrimination by entities beyond the state. Article 15, 2 prohibits disabilities, restrictions or conditions for citizens concerning access to places like shops, hotels, wells and places of public resort. Article 17 abolishes untouchability providing a constitutional shield against certain forms of private discrimination. However, these provisions, though crucial in themselves, are confined to specific places and practices, illustrating the constitutional recognition of the need to combat private discrimination. The oversight in recognizing indirect discrimination as a form of injustice, coupled with the absence of proactive measures to address it, reflects fundamental assumptions about the nature of the right against discrimination. Transforming this paradigm necessitates a thorough examination of how laws impact the opportunities, freedoms, and dignity of diverse societal groups. Drafting rules around indirect discrimination demands a nuanced exploration by the judiciary into differentiating it from direct discrimination, delving into the intricacies of both intention and effect. This intricate interplay between intention of the law and its effect, as illustrated by the Supreme Court, compels a holistic reassessment of the foundations of the right against discrimination. I would like to ground this theoretical exploration briefly made by me in the harsh reality of housing discrimination, drawing attention to a glaring example from the Vattavada Panchayat in Kerala. Here, members of the Chakalinian community identified as Dalits, experience the egregious denial of entry into local barber shops. The discrimination faced by Dalits extended beyond barber shops and encompassed access to water, a poignant reflection, a reflection of societal bias. Dr. Baba Saheb Bhimra Ambedkar's insight into the social and cultural implications of water was profound. He keenly recognized the intersection of water with caste dynamics acknowledging its role in perpetuating complex hierarchies. 
water was not merely a source of sustenance, but a deeply contested entity entangled with caste-based exclusion. This manifested through denying Dalits access to water sources, monopolizing control over water bodies by upper castes, embedding caste biases in cultural and religious contexts related to water, silencing Dalit narratives and wisdom on water, and relegating discussions on caste and water as peripheral. For Dalits, water was not just life-giving. It became a symbol of anguish and segregation. The Mahar Satyagraha became a focal point for social change based on the quest of access to water. To further grasp the per pervasive nature of private discrimination, consider the plight of individuals facing bias, facing bias in employment based on their sexuality. This is not a hypothetical scenario. It is a harsh reality faced by many individuals, shedding light on the urgency of dismantling discriminatory practices deeply ingrained in private spheres. Moreover, another example came to my attention when one of my young law clerks recently showed me an Instagram reel depicting the entrepreneurial journey of a determined young woman. Despite her innovative business ideas and evident merit, the reel revealed the systemic discrimination she faced in securing funding. Investors, influenced by gender bias, dismissively overlooked her proposals, exemplifying the pervasive challenges women encounter in entrepreneurship. Her resilience in the face of these discriminatory barriers served as a powerful testament to the urgent need for challenging and transforming biased norms within private spheres. These experiences collectively underscore the imperative of dismantling discriminatory practices and fostering inclusiveness within the private spheres of our society. The Supreme Court's decision, the Supreme Court's decision in Zoroastrian Cooperative Housing Society Limited versus District Registrar Cooperative Societies in 2005 comes to mind when we talk about discriminatory practices in the housing sphere. In this case, a Parsi Zoroastrian Cooperative Housing Society, guided by bylaws that explicitly restricted non Parsis from becoming members, came under legal scrutiny. The society contended that it was a Parsi Zoroastrian association exercising its rights under Article 191C, which guarantees the freedom to form associations and argued that this right allowed them to exclude membership on the basis of religion. The court, accepting the argument, construed the issue as to whether cooperative societies, essentially being associations, could legitimately discriminate between citizens. The Supreme Court concluded that they could discriminate. This judicial stance raises profound and intricate questions about the delicate balance between individual freedom and the imperative com of combating discriminatory practices within private entities. There is a sting in the tail to this judgment. This judgment overruled sub silentio, a decision rendered by me as a single judge of the Bombay High Court, where a cooperative housing society I held could not discrimination on the base of caste or community. Uh, the sting in the tail was that my judgment as a single judge of the Bombay High Court was reported in scale, which is exclusively devoted to printing Supreme Court judgments. Well, I got the report in scale, but we lost the wider battle to the Supreme Court. And as they say, the Supreme Court is not right, is not final because it is right, it is right because it is final. I guess somebody would say that was some of my judgments later on, I guess. The judgment in the Indian Medical Association versus Union of India, likewise in 2011, has expanded the scope of constitutional protection against horizontal discrimination by incorporating educational institutions within the meaning of shops under Article 15.2. Our court has ensured fundamental rights protection for anyone facing discrimination in such establishments. This marks a constitutional response to horizontal discrimination, providing a potent tool for challenging exclusionary private covenants. This renewed interpretation calls for an exploration of other services considered public in the relevant sense 
opening avenues for challenging discriminatory practices across diverse sectors. And the last two minutes, may I just wrap it all up by having a section which I have titled, Crafting and Inclusion of Tomorrow. As seen through the examples which I have reiterated in the course of my presentation, courts have recognized that a seemingly neutral law might be a tool of oppression for a particular group. To truly achieve substantive equality, the impact of its provisions must be understood in the context of social realities. Overcoming socially ascribed roles necessitates transcending artificial public-private di dichotomies. Addressing power imbalances wherever they thrive becomes an imperative of our time. Our laws are powerful tools in opening up our public spaces as well as curbing private discrimination. Equally important, if not more, are the mechanisms that mediate access to law. A simple requirement that seems to be neutral, such as that the cause list that all the courts across the country publish may exclude certain persons from accessing the law itself. Simple requirements like these highlight that discrimination is still embedded within the processes of our system. If a person with visual impairment is unable to access the cause list or is having to spend more effort and time than anyone else to peruse the contents of the cause list, the promise of equal law and equal protection of laws loses some heft to them. Recently, in 2023, the Supreme Court State of the Judicial Re Judiciary Report indicates that only 30.4% of district court complexes have separate washrooms for persons with disabilities and other infrastructural support such as tactile paving and wheelchairs are available in less than 30% of our court complexes. In preparing for their day in court, rather than sharpening their arguments and submissions, a lawyer or litigant is forced to account for parking arrangements and spot washroom facilities inside the court complex. Leave the spaces of our courtrooms to access a sanitary napkin dispenser. Is the burden not on us to cure this situation? They have access to the law and also the court, but the hurdles placed in their way will qualify the ability to actually benefit from the access which we have provided to them. This immediately places them at a disadvantage compared to those who could spend more time with their files. Inadvertently, then, we are telling our lawyers and litigants that it is not the law's concern to intercede between such hidden forms of discrimination. To truly overcome stereotypical roles, the law and policy should transcend the public-private dichotomy and address power imbalances regardless of their location. This requires a comprehensive approach that considers societal context, historical perspectives, and the jurisprudence of discrimination law. By doing so, we pave the way for a society where equality is not mere a slogan, but a lived reality for all our members. The legal landscape must evolve, weaving a tapestry that accommodates differences eradicates biases, and ensures substantive equality. Let us then, in our tribute to Justice ESV, as legal practitioners, scholars, and advocates, pledge to be architects of change, contributing to a tomorrow where the rights of every citizen, regardless of ability or background, are not just protected, but celebrated. And excesses, regardless of the location, are interfered with. Thank you. Namaskar.